Thank you. All right, we're going back, back to our sheet that we were working on last week about the uh, different names of Satan. And uh, I have a few sheets up here if you didn't get one. There you go. Wayne, that's your job, brother. Okay, thank you. If you didn't get one, it's the same one we've had for a couple of weeks, though. From, it says, what's in a name? And we ended up uh, last week and we didn't get finished. So we're going to do that tonight. Um, one of these uh, is his name is called the evil one. Now on your sheet, I think it says Matthew 537, but I want to give you a better scripture, 1 John 519. And I'd like for you to look there if you would with me, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. This was kind of interesting. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world, world lieth in wickedness. The, uh, some of the better translations says they lieth in the evil one. And the word here um, is the word for absolute corruption. And the thing that's so interesting about that to me, and I, I don't know if you have thought about it this way, but I wondered, let's just take a, a religion like Islam. How is it that a person can believe that their God would have them to strap a bomb to their chest and walk into a crowded place and blow themselves up and kill a bunch of people? How is it that they could see the, the justification for taking a plane and flying it into a building and kill thousands of people? How could they be so, and I don't know other way to use it, warped? And I tell you exactly how, because Satan has blinded their eyes. He has, he has placed this, this, and he has done it in the, in the realm of an ideology or, or a, a religion. And they believe that they're right in this. They are justified in this. And, the, and again, I'm not jumping on the, the uh, Muslims, but... I just want you to understand something. When people, anybody that would say that the Allah that the Muslims worship and, and the, the true and living God are the same, they're wrong. Right. And if they say that the Quran and the scriptures are, are compatible, they're wrong. But it, it's, and I, I read this and it jumped off the page at me today when I was reading it. Satan doesn't work so much in regard to behaviors. And why doesn't he? Because our flesh takes care of that. We've got the flesh, and the flesh is corrupt. And it's evil, and it's wicked, and it's sinful. So the flesh takes care of behaviors. He works on the mind. He, he works in the area of implanting and disguising evil and calling it good, and calling it truth, and calling it right. Um, how is it that these big corporations could save money uh, and, and by doing so pollute water and make people sick? It, it, and they justify this. And they don't see anything wrong with it. It's all in the idea of profit. And this is all what Satan's behind. He is the evil one. He is the one that corrupts even the good things of life and takes them and makes them into something that's bad. And um, so he says, the whole world here in verse 19, the whole world lieth in wickedness, in the wicked one, in the evil one. And this is the devil. Um, the second one, the next one is the, in John 8, 44, um, where Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. And th this is very interesting. Um, why would you think that Jesus would say that about the devil, that he is the father of lies? How could he be the father of lies? What did he do to her? He lied to her. He lied. And here's the interesting thing. He lied to her. And then she lied 
because she lied about what God said. And then she got Adam to sin. Now, she was deceived. But Adam went in with his eyes wide open. And guess what happened when Adam sinned? We all became liars. Now, here's something, again, this has been really good today. I have spent some time with this and, and uh, kind of going refreshing on this. But this fellow said, listen, are we liars because we lie? Or do we lie because we're already liars? Now, this ain't the chicken and the egg thing, all right? So this is it, all right? Yeah. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says that, that a baby cries when there's nothing wrong. And I don't know about your babies, but mine did. So, no, we, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And he is the father of lies. He is a perpetual liar. Who's the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the tr way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. And listen to me. And I'm going to say this and, and I'll stand behind it. Every single method of the, of the devil is wrapped in deceit somehow. Every single one of them. He can't tell you the truth. He takes a good truth, a good idea, a good concept, and he begins to wrap it up with a deceit in some fashion. And I can give you a, an illustration of that in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And this is what it says uh, about the devil and his crew. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It says, let me go back uh, to 13. It says, for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And that's no marvel, that's no surprise. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, these spirit beings that we've been talking about, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So I think I've said this before, but he disguises himself. And he doesn't disguise himself as a drug addict or a porn pusher. He disguises himself as a righteous person. He comes across as a preacher. He comes across as the politician. He comes across as a, uh, a person that's a good person, and he wants to do good things. But he's a deceiver, and he is the father of lies, and he will lie to you. He tells, huh? What was that that you gave? The last one I gave was 2 Corinthians 11, 14. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. So he's going to lie to you. And how many times has he taken somebody, and we, have, we all know we have a drug problem, and taken to somebody and said, man, if you'll just do this, you'll feel better. He doesn't tell them what's on the other side. Uh, he doesn't tell them what's coming, not, coming later. He doesn't tell them about the misery. Uh, that. Look at our advertising on TV. Uh, we were talking about this the other day, um, and, and Becca could uh, and identify with this. You know, Now the doctors don't get to prescribe medicine. The advertisers tell you what to go ask for. You know. But if you've watched those commercials, they said, you know, now this will make you, and this is this, they'll do this and this. But the side effects are, and da, 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 da. who would take it after that, you know? I used five other pills just to take it. Yeah, to fix that one, that's right. And they happen to sell all five of them. Uh, but look at the commercials. I mean, look at the, the beer commercials and the alcohol commercials and the cigarette commercials and, and all of those kind of things. They never show you that guy that's got his lungs caved in and, and sucking wind through a pipe, you know. I mean, one of the things that the health, the government uh, Department of Health has done is put on these, um, 
uh, public service announcements and you see this gal, she's got no teeth and no hair and she's you know, breathing through a trach and, and she tells you about the fact that you know, she started smoking and that, that's the truth. But the devil lies and he'll lie to you. He'll lie to you about what's right, and what's good. Yeah. And uh, it's all over. He, he's just a liar. Um, the next one that I want us to look at, and this one I think is, uh, I'd like to spend just a little bit of time with. It's called the God of this world. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Let's just go back to verse 1 and start reading. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But... If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, I think I've referred to this before, but I want to just make this again. I want you to understand this. When you're trying to witness to somebody, just like Steve and these others who've tried to share their faith, folks, you can't win people to Christ. You can be a witness. You can share your faith. You can share the gospel. But no matter how clever, no matter what plan you use, no matter how many classes you've taken, no matter how great your illustrations are, no matter how eloquent you might be, none of those things are going to win people to Jesus Christ. And the reason is, is because their hearts are darkened, their hearts are covered, and Satan has blinded their hearts. He hasn't blinded the gospel. The gospel's clear. The problem is their hearts, and he is called the God of this world. Now, what do you think that means? Because if you'll notice in that verse, the word God has what kind of a letter to it? Little g. He, that's the devil, and he is the God of this world. What's, what's he talking about when he talks about the God of this world? Yeah. But what world is he talking about? He's talking about this world that we live in, but he's talking about more than just the physical structure of the world. He's talking about the world system, the ideas, the educational system, the government systems. He's talking about that world. And he is the God of this world. Now, why would he use the word God? Is he God? No. Does he want to be? Yes. Exactly that. His whole deal here is to establish a kingdom here in contrast and in competition to God's kingdom. He wants a kingdom like God because that's what he wanted to be, right? That's what happened when he was in heaven. He said, I will be like God. I will bring myself above the stars. I will sit on the equal par with God. I want to be the king. Well, God took care of that. So he has established in this world system that we live a hostile environment that he runs. Why would you think? Yes.
narrow minded, yes, sure. Yeah. They don't understand and they can't see it. And wow, I mean, if you don't know the word of God, sure. Anybody ever hear, heard, heard of humanism? What is humanism? Somebody tell me. What? Exactly. Who makes the final decision? Who's it up to? It's up to me. And it's up to you. You decide what you think is right, what is wrong, and, and you can't tell me that I'm wrong, and I can't tell you that you're wrong. There's a verse in the Old Testament at the end of the period of Judges, and it says, and every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Folks, the principle of humanism is the foundational principle behind our educational system, our government. Did you ever scratch your head and say, why in the world is the government passing laws to do that? And they, they defend this, but they won't defend this. It's because they're their whole philosophy of living is humanistic. It's about I can solve my own problems. I don't need God. I can fix it everything myself. And so humanism is, is behind all of this. Man is considered to be self-determining. I'm smart enough. I can, with the right education, with the right training, with the right information, I can solve anything. Yes. No. If it feels good, do it. It's all relative, exactly. And the thing about it is this, and I, I always laugh in a, in a sense. I don't know how you folks are, but when we have an, a, a big election and all those campaign ads on TV about pull what hair I got left out. And here's what's so ironic about that to me. These people, men and women, will get on and they will make promises that we know they're not going to keep, but we vote in, vote in them for it. anyway. And, and they keep getting wilder and, and scarier and further a stream, but we buy into it. Because some, huh? A lot of people believe that stuff, really. Well, they do. A lot of people believe that. Um. But see, that's the lie. Yeah. It's the lie. Another thing that he uses in this world, and I know that you'll recognize this, materialism. What is materialism? That's right. <laughs> a high value, a high value on stuff. He who has the most toys wins. No, he who has the most toys doesn't have much money because he spent it all on his toys. Uh, but seriously, materialism, and then what you were talking about, Vanda is, is morality, how he has twisted morality. I mean, if you'd have told me 25 years ago that we would be where we are, not just with homosexuality, but now we have transgenders and, and who knows what else. I mean, and, and that's what Satan wants. That's what he wants because he is corrupting this present world. Now, here's something to think about. Let me go back to my notes here. I want to see if I can find this. Um, does God acknowledge him as being the God of this world? No. Does he? Now, think, think about that one a minute. That's exactly right. Okay, if God doesn't dispute that, why in the world would God let him do that? You say, well, I'm not God, so I don't know. Seriously, I'm asking the question, why would God let him have rain like he does and, and let him do? Now, remember, please remember this. He cannot do one thing that he doesn't get permission to do. Remember Job? Back in the Old Testament, he said, can I do this? And God said, you can do this, but that's all you can do. You can do this, but that's all you can do. So he, he's limited. But why would God let him have the freedom that he does? God's calling out a people for his own name. Exactly right. 
That's exactly right. He says that God is calling out a people for his own name. The, one of the purposes, I believe, is that God is allowing him to reign so that more people can come to faith. That he is giving the opportunity for people to repent. For he is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God is giving him that extra time, if you will, and an extra rope. But he's going to hang himself, folks, to trust me. But it's the fact that as we have a clear indication of the progression of God's timetable, what is it? What's the mark of the end times? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Lord. And we are getting there fast. You know, people say today, oh, the terrible situations. This is not the first time things like this has happened in world history. Um, Rome particularly was a particularly vile, immoral, corrupt uh, society. Even though they were intellectually and governmentally powerful, they still were immoral people. And they were infiltrated with all different kinds of perverse religions and so forth. Uh, the Temple of Diana and Zeus and all them other guys. So uh, Satan has been up to this for a while. He's well practiced. You have a question? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely, because he's been here since the first ones, and he's watched, and he's smart. Our battle begins the day we get saved, because Satan lost something that was his. Absolutely. And he hates God, and so now he hates those who belong to God. And he's going to counterfeit. He's a counterfeiter. He is not, he will take something and, and, and just twist it a little bit. If I was going to make counterfeit money, would I put, you know, Donald Duck's picture on it? Oh, I, I had a patient one time, this is a true, he, he bought a set of hearing aids from me and he was kind of kooky, I'll just make nice and say that, um, and he said, I'm just going to sign Donald Duck on my check, and I said, well, you're going to have to come write me another one, it went through, it went through the bank, so I tell everybody I sold Donald Duck hearing aids, so... Uh, Let's look at a couple of things here. Look, at, uh, look in the book of James, James chapter 1. And you don't have all of these verses. That's why I'm referring you to them. James chapter 1 and verse uh, 27. It said, pure religion... And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world, the world system. What's wrong with the world system? It's corrupt. It's perverted. It's twisted. It's twisted in its thinking. That's the reason Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he said that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to what? This world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. This is why we studied the scriptures, so that we learn to think correctly, so that we understand the truth. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's truth that you stands against the enemy, and we'll see that as we get into the armor here. But... He is a perverter. Look over in, um, yeah, I'm going all over the place here. James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Wheresoever therefore, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You have to make a choice. You can't be on the, in the middle. You're either serving God or you're serving the devil. That's why Jesus told the religious leaders, he said, you may be religious, you may be good Jews, but you are of your father, the devil. They were blinded, they were perverted and twisted. So how does he do all this? Well, first of all, in 1 John it says there's three things, and there's the lust of the flesh, 
which means what? Satisfy every your desire. No limits. If it feels good, do it. There's the lust of the eyes. Whatever you see and you want it, get it. And then finally, the pride of life. Whatever you get, make sure you brag about it. Boast that all you have, be arrogant, prideful, selfish. Live for the here and now as the most important place. What is the, is it the Budweiser commercial? You only go around once this life. Grab all the gusto you can. Well, listen, folks, you go ahead, but I don't think you're going to like the results. Why? Because this ain't all there is. We're not here forever. In fact, our life is but a vapor that appears for a while and it passes away. But we're going to spend eternity with God. And what devil wants you and I to do is to waste that vapor, spend it on ourselves. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to get what you want. It doesn't matter if you're going to go in financial bondage. It doesn't matter if you've got to lie, cheat, or steal. It doesn't matter. If you don't like your wife, go find you another woman. If you don't like, you know, the, your sexual orientation, you can be something whatever you want. And he used it. Huh? You you That's right. Oh, absolutely. Exactly right. That's all we deserve is hell, death and hell. But he doesn't tell you the truth. And let, let me just throw something in here, and this might mix up the fire a little bit, but let me just throw something in here. You have to be careful today about who you listen to religiously because so many churches and so many preachers have watered down the gospel. They've watered it down. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about hell. They don't talk about repentance. You know, God wants you to have a better life. God wants you to, God, well, yeah, he wants you to have a better life. He's preparing one for you. But in the meantime, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be you want it, the way you want it. Paul says the thing is that, that I, I glory in my tribulations. I glory in my distresses because when I am weak, then am I strong. Oh, but they promise you health and wealth, and God wants you to be wealthy, and he wants you to drive a new Cadillac or a Mercedes or, and live in the nicest house. And, 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 you know, and if you're not, it's not God's fault. It's your fault because you don't have enough faith. Well, folks, that's a lie. And the guy that's saying that is preaching out of this book, supposedly. But it's perverted. It's taking and twisting, and it's that deceptiveness. He takes the truth and he just twists it just enough, just enough. It sounds good. That's why, folks, we've got to know the book. We've got to know the book. You have a question? It always gets me, it really does get me when, he, when they start just talking about just give me that seed money. Um, oh, really? If I give you this money, you're going to bless me? Oh, really? And, and what, what really burns me up about that, seriously, they prey on people who don't know any better and don't have the money to do that. Absolutely. I don't know. I must have missed that channel. I don't know. I just. I call him Evil Murdoch. I think it's Murdoch. I call him Evil Murdoch. I don't know. I do. Well, but what they are saying is they believe it is God's will for you to be rich, and they believe it is God's will for you to be healthy, and it is God's will for you to have everything. They believe that, and, and that's what they're, without saying so, that's why they're preaching it. It is God's willing. God's got the bankroll up in heaven. He's waiting to give it to you. He's waiting to make sure that you never get sick, you never a uh, problem uh, again. The, 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 the holdup is not him. The holdup is you and me. We don't have enough faith. 
Well, I got news for you. The Apostle Paul said that he had a thorn in the flesh, and I'm beginning to understand a little bit about that. I hope it wasn't headaches, but, uh, and he prayed for three times for God to take him away. And what did God say? No. My grace is sufficient. I don't want you to trust in your headaches. I want you to trust in me. And where did Paul spend a lot of his time? In jail. <laughs> Beaten. Beaten. Left for dead. Stoned. Doesn't sound like he had much faith, does it? Well, yeah, he wrote over half of the New Testament, so I guess it was okay. God put his books in there. But I just want you to see. Do you see how it works? But it's so easy because they sound so good. I was watching a, a little YouTube video today. How many of you know who Ravi Zacharias is? So not very, okay. Well, Ravi Zacharias is an apologist. And basically, he just goes into these universities and places and he just defends the faith. He went to Cambridge University. Um, he took classes under Stephen Hawkins, who just died. Uh, and uh, it, this was the thing. And this young man got up. He was in a university forum with some other Christian men, uh, preachers and, and theologians. And this fella st started to ask him this question. And he, he thought he was really smug, this young man did. I mean, he started quoting all these people, and, you know, we already know that the Bible's not true. It's been proven that God is not a reality. It's been proven that uh, these things, and there was no such thing as Noah's Ark. There was this. This is all a myth. It's just a fancy thing. So on the basis of that, how can you say this? And he asked them the question. <laughs> and in about seven minutes, Ravi Zacharias ate his lunch. And he just started quoting the scriptures. And he said, so you believe this, huh? And, and before he was done, in less than 10 minutes, that poor kid sat down and he didn't know what to say. You see, they buy into this stuff. They swallow it and they spew it back out, but they don't understand. And somebody says, how can somebody so smart do that? Because it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of spiritual blindness. It's spiritual. Just what we read in that verse. He has blinded the minds and the hearts so that the gospel can't. Listen, whenever we share the gospel with anybody, whether it's me on the mission field or you at work or at the grocery store, wherever it is, when we get done, we ought to go away praying, God, take the blindness off their hearts. Help them to see it. Not because of me, but because it's the truth. Because God's got to remove the blindness. He's got a one that, to, that the Spirit of God's got to bring conviction to them and make them see it. Otherwise, the devil's just got them. He's just got them. And so, he's going. Let's look at, uh, we got time. Look at one more, a couple more verses here. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. This is another name here. Ephesians 2.2, 2, uh, let's start with verse 1, Ephesians 2. And you, he's speaking to the believers here at Ephesus, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know that all your relatives that aren't saved are dead? They're walking dead people. What do they call those, zombies? I mean, seriously, isn't that what they call them? The, the, everybody's in dig with zombies, even my granddaughter. She said, hey, Papa, I said, look at it, zombies. I said, what in the world are you doing that for? Uh, he said, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now, dead is not meaning annihilation. Me, dead means separation. So when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, it simply means they separated us from God. We were separate from him. We, were, we had no receptors in order to pick up who God is, we were spiritually dead. Wherein, verse 2, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
the idea here again is similar to the one we looked at before, but this, this has to do of an age. He says he is the prince of this age would be a better word here. What that means is that God's got a time frame on him. He's got a time. He got a time from the beginning. He's got a time at the end, and God's going to change everything. And what's God's plan to change everything? What's God going to do? He's going to come back. He's going to come back, and he's going to put an end to him. Look in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. He's given him some freedom, and he knows what that end is. 1 John 2, 17. Look what it says. It says, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. When Jesus comes back, when he returns, the kingdom of Satan will be replaced by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. And he will rule over the world, and Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. It's an interesting point, Ephesians 2. You know, Satan's called the prince. Mm -hmm. He's not called the king. The prince only has as much power as the king allows him to have. That's exactly right. Very good point. But... The idea here, by using that term, is that means that he is a ruler. He is a ruler. That's what he talks about in Ephesians 6 when it says, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. So in this atmosphere, in this world that around us, he, he's, in, he's running it. But, huh? For now. For now. Exactly. But God's going to fix that. And he's going to put an end to all of that. Um, let me see. I've got a couple more here, but uh, let, let me just do one more, okay? Uh, that's tempter. Uh, the name Satan, by the way, is the one that's used most for, for him in all of the scriptures. That's the number one. Name. It means adversary or enemy. But I want to look at the tempter thing for just a minute. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 5. We'll look at two, two verses here. First Corinthians seven five. All right. It said, "Defraud not one another, except it be consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency." He's talking about sexual relations here, and he's saying, "Look, Satan will use that." God's given, by the way, that whole chapter is a really good chapter there uh, about moral purity and what God wants, but he says Satan will use it. He uses it if you're abstaining. He uses it if you're indulging. He uses it either way. He's a tempter. Now, what, how does he tempt us? He tempts us using the very natural needs and desires that God put in us. What does it say in the book of James? It says, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, and he's the shadow of turning. Everything, our, our appetite, our sexuality, our needs, all of those things God gave them, gave it to us. But he gave us a means to satisfy that within his will. Every one of them. There's nothing that he doesn't satisfy within his will. But Satan comes along and he says, hey, God's just being mean. He's narrow-minded. He really doesn't want you to be happy. Isn't that what Satan said to Eve in the garden? God's holding out on you. He knows that the moment that you take from that tree, he knows that you will be like God's. And so Satan tempts us. One more verse here. Look over in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're keeping them boys up there in a hurry tonight, don't we? Move them around. Earn their keep tonight. We have to raise their pay. James chapter 1, verse 13. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Let me make this clear. Temptation, please listen. Temptation is always a solicitation 
to do evil. God tests us, but he tests us to approve us. Satan tempts us to do evil, to sin, to satisfy. He says, no man, don't him say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. God doesn't tempt us. Satan tempts you. But every person, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. What does he do it? What does he attempt? He doesn't tempt you with something you don't care about. That's not, you know, I go fishing and if I hang a tin can on the end of my hook, I ain't going to get any fish. But if I put a worm on there, that's a different story. And he tempts us. He knows us. And he says, and you know what? I know that Mel Mock and I know that he likes this. And he hangs it out there. And he just dangles it until I look. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, that'd be nice. You know. Boy, if I had a Corvette like my associate did, I just. <laughs> and you can put anything else you want in there. He says, listen, God doesn't do that. That's the enemy. He says, verse 15, when lust has conceived, when the desire is satisfied, you say, well, I got to do something. You take action. What happens? It brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. God tests you, Satan tempts you. And temptation is always a solicitation to do evil. All right, I've covered a lot of stuff here. Anybody have a question? I, I just want to say, you know, we're, not, we're just pilgrims and strangers here. Just sure. just passing through. That's right. But we have to live here in we it. Have to live here. We have to live here in it. And we have to be aware of the conditions of the world. It is not going to be a friend to grace. And the world is not going to look on us and say, oh, aren't you good people? They're going to say, you're kooks, you're nuts. You go to church on Wednesday night and listen to some bald-headed guy stand up and talk to you about the devil? <laughs> you guys are nuts. That's what they want you to believe. The world is not a friend of grace because the enemy runs this world here, here, for now. We're just passing through. That's why, folks, we live by this book. If it isn't in here and I say it, you ignore it, okay? Check it out. Because, folks, this is the only thing that matters is what God says. And we need to equip ourselves in it. And that's why when I teach or preach, I got to give you the book. And then you can argue with God. All right, anybody else? Comments, questions? All right, well, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I just hope that by your word and by your spirit tonight that, that these truths as we have studied together over these weeks, that they will be implanting themselves in these people's heart, that they will be on guard that they'll be alert, that they'll be getting in this book and understanding. And as we, in the weeks to come, as we understand you, what you have provided for us, the, the armor that we can have and put on so that we can stand and stand in the evil day against the wicked wiles of the devil, you've given us a means to stand. We don't have to succumb. We don't have to give in. We don't have to yield to temptation. We can have our minds transformed and learn to think correctly and clearly. And as a result, we can help guide people out of darkness into light. Thank you for helping us tonight. Thank you for your word, instruction. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that opens it up to us and helps us to understand it. And God, may we just walk in that truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.